what you did was, instead of helping you to work out all these parts, you go bigger ones. Hi, sweethearts! Do you want to come over here? Yeah. What are your girls? Their king, because they have refused to return to me. 
The sword rages in their cities, it consumes their oracle priests, and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. To the most high they call, but he does not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zemoed? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and the world. The Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They shall go before the Lord who roars like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come, trum shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return, to, return them to their homes, says the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Thank you.
yourself, your soul, will be demanded of you. He was going to die. And the things that he had saved up would become the inheritance of others. So we come full circle, right back to an inheritance. So what was wrong with these guys? Now we might have thought that it was inappropriate for the guy in the crowd to stand up and make this demand on Jesus that he intercede on his intercede with his brother. But this was not an unusual request. The rabbi in the community was often called to arbitrate in family and civil matters. And also, we tend to read into this parable all kinds of evil motives for the rich farmer. And we've been hearing the last few weeks from the prophecies of Amos and Hosea. They, they talk about evil people with false scales that, that cheat the poor people. And so we want this rich farmer to be something like that. You know, with all of his ill-gotten gains. You know, we want it to be about class. This guy was rich, and we're not, so there's something wrong there. Also, we want this story to be about stewardship. After all, Jesus did say at the end, so it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Okay, rather than store up all of his grain in barns, we want him to give it to the poor. But there's nothing like either of those two ideas in this parable. God's people began storing up things in barns as soon as they stopped being a nomadic people. Okay, if you remember the story of Joseph, okay, Joseph was, was uh, kidnapped, I guess, and sent into Egypt. And we read in Genesis chapter 41 that Joseph stored up grain for the benefit and indeed the survival of all the people. And God used that for the preservation of Israel during a time of famine. So despite all the evil that befell Joseph, God meant it for good. Indeed, full barns were considered a blessing from God. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, Moses told the people just before they crossed over into the promised land, he said, If you will only obey the Lord your God, the Lord will command a blessing upon you in your barns, and in all that you undertake, he will bless you in the land. Certainly, this rich farmer in Jesus' parable had been blessed by God. In Psalm 144, we read, O Lord, what are human beings that you regard them, or mortals that you think of them? May our barns be filled with produce of every kind. May our sheep increase by thousands, by tens of thousands, in our fields, and may our cattle be heavy with young. Happy are the people to whom such blessings fall. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. And then in Proverbs chapter 3, Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your produce, then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. I think the worst thing that we can say about this rich farmer is what God said about him. You fool. And we learn a little bit about what it means to be a fool from the movie Forrest Gump. He said, 
Mama always said, stupid is as stupid does. Now the character of Forrest Gump was not stupid. Now he was differently challenged, but he was not a fool. The Bible tells us a lot about fools, especially in the wisdom literature like Proverbs. It teaches us that a fool is anyone who fails to notice how the world works. The way that God created the world. Not the way other fools want the world to be. And a fool is anyone who fails to notice how the world works. Fools are like the three stooges. We all like the three stooges, right? They, they, would, they would set up the gag. And the whole world is watching, and we knew what was coming. Okay, and we watched it, it was coming, and we see it coming, and we see it coming, and then whap! Mo gets hit in the head with a board. Fools are unteachable. They won't listen when others point them toward wisdom. Fools are often in error, but never in doubt. People eventually give up on fools. They become an island to themselves, happily living in a world of their own making. But the really telling thing about fools comes from Psalm 14, verse 1. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. There is no God. Now before we get too comfortable with our own wisdom, what this is saying is not that fools think that God doesn't exist but rather they think that God doesn't exist here. God is not close enough to see or to be bothered with my life. So what I do and what I say and what I think has nothing to do with God. When we understand that, then we are all very foolish, at least some of the time. Now the inheritance which the man wanted Jesus' help with and, and the farmer's bumper crop, they share one thing in common. They like the grace of God which brings us our inheritance, you know, our adoption as children of God and salvation in Jesus Christ. These were both gained through no effort nor merit of the people who received them. The inheritance came from someone else who worked hard and then died. The, the bumper crop, okay, is, as we've seen, the bumper crop comes from the blessing of God. Now, no, no doubt, there, it, farming is hard work, you know, tilling the soil and, and sowing the seed and all that, but it is God who brings the right amount of sunshine and rain and the right temperatures to make the little plants grow. Now, farmers should know this, and farmers should be grateful. And this is what Jesus was getting at. He was asking us where we are with our hearts. There were causes for gratitude here, and yet there was no gratitude. And God said, you fool. This fell on deaf ears then, as it does now. And there are many in our society who feel they don't need a God 
or would really prefer that God and God's people would just go away. However, we know the promises of God. We know the faithfulness of God. We know the commandments of God. And we know that all of our stuff, even our very life, the breath we take in and let out, and indeed our very existence is only by the gracious will of God through the Holy Spirit who is the breath of God. For this, for this, we are grateful and in gratitude we are obedient to God. Paul told us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 to give thanks in all circumstances. This was the same place where he told us to pray without ceasing. Our call to worship today came from Psalm 107 and it started with, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for God is good whose steadfast love endures forever. Now I am grateful for God's steadfast love and, and I am grateful for all of you. My prayer for you and for me is that as we are sanctified by the Holy Spirit and, and as we grow and mature in our Christian life, may we be grateful in all circumstances for the steadfast love of the Father and may the love of the Son, Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, shine with greater and greater brightness through us into this dark and hurting and angry world. So may all God's people say, Amen.